join me in the opening sentences. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil, and make us children of God, and heirs of eternal life. Grant that, having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As I was reading this week's gospel lesson from Matthew, it occurred to me, that I know something about waiting for a wedding. I'm not just talking about waiting for the engagement, which did, by the way, take over five years. <laughs> Bless my sweet husband's heart. But a week after he proposed in early December of 2019, we finally set a date for the wedding in June of 2020. At that time, we had no idea how drastically our plans would have to change. I mean, the wedding was only six months away. What kind of world-changing, life-altering, earth-shattering thing could happen in the meantime? But when the unimaginable came to pass in mid-March, and schools and churches and restaurants and parks and the like began to close, well, we suddenly felt our plans hanging in the balance. Sure, most people thought it would be over and done with in a matter of weeks, but what if they were wrong? What if the day we've been waiting for for so long couldn't happen? Or at least not in a way that we would have ever remotely thought it would happen. And so we began to wait and sit and watch and anxiously hope for answers about what the future might hold. And it's no spoiler to any of you to tell you that the global pandemic, well, it did not end in time for our hoped-for, pew-packed, liturgy-laced wedding. But even so, on a warm Saturday afternoon in June, God showed up in a nearly empty cathedral. With less than 15 people in the room, love permeated every inch of the space.
space, overflowing out into the streets of Nashville among our family and friends and community. Christ's presence was there in the sacrament of our marriage, though not at the time or the place or in the way that we would have expected. It's interesting to me that our lectionary text for this week is one about watching and waiting. Not only has that been our task for the last eight months, as we have eagerly awaited a reprieve from the coronavirus and a return to normal life, but it seems especially apropos in these uncertain days, while our nation has been anxiously anticipating the results of a highly contested and emotionally charged presidential election. And even now, as I stand here filming this sermon for Sunday, November 8th, the winner has not yet been determined, and there are still plenty of votes to be counted. The past 48 hours or so have been filled with communal concern and angst. Many of us just glued to our devices, trying to make sense of what the next several days or weeks or even months will look like. It seems important then that in this particular moment we turn our attention to the parable, which seems to be offering up some wisdom about how to live in a period of waiting. This text from the Gospel of Matthew comes from a multi-chapter speech or a sermon that Jesus gives to his disciples. It's known as the Eschatological Discourse, and it's a series of four stories that he shares with his inner circle about how to behave in an in-between time. And the parable for today, the parable of the ten bridesmaids, is the second of the four, with this one focusing specifically on how Christians ought to wait, about how they should live in the space after Jesus leaves the earth, but before he returns again at the end of the age. See, for Matthew's readers, this was an imminent concern. This group of new Christians he was communicating with, they expected Jesus would be returning quickly, any minute now, really. and. These instructional texts became incredibly important for helping them know what to do in the meantime, how to stay alert and awake for Jesus' impending homecoming, which many felt was already past due. But to tell you the truth, I struggle with these texts from Matthew, which can feel so divisive. These parables and the gospel of Matthew in general that we've been hearing week after week this season, it seems to be constantly separating people into different groups of right and wrong. The wheat and the weeds, the sheep and the goats, the insiders and the outsiders, and for today's parable, the foolish and the wise. Matthew's general harshness can be disturbing to us especially in these days of undeniable and ever-increasing division among us. So what ultimately can be gleaned from this parable? Well, the story begins with ten bridesmaids, who in the evening take their lamps to meet the bridegroom in order to accompany him to his wedding banquet. But something unexpected Happens, something out of a sitcom, really. The groom is late. <laughs> like, really late. So late that the bridesmaids actually fall asleep waiting for him. And finally, at midnight, he arrives, but half the bridesmaids have run out of oil, leaving the lamps that were meant to guide them through the night useless. They ask those who had extra oil to share, but after being denied and Feeling like they have no other option, they leave and search for, I don't know, a 24-hour Walgreens at the time to get some more oil. And lo and behold, while they're away, the groom arrives, and they miss the opportunity to join the party. But what exactly 
did the foolish bridesmaids do wrong here? What did they do that made them foolish? I mean, it was the groom, after all, who was running late. How prepared were they supposed to have been? I can't remember the last time I went to a wedding hauling around extra food or water or gasoline in case of some kind of emergency. In my reading of the text, I've come to see that I don't ultimately think the mistake of the bridesmaids is that they didn't bring enough oil. I think their mistake was that their fear of not having enough distracted them from their purpose. I wonder what might have happened if they would have just stayed put, trusting not in their lamps, but in the light of Christ to lead them through the darkness of the night. Perhaps what Jesus is trying to communicate through this parable is the necessity to stay present to remain in relationship with God and one another, to continue to seek out God's presence, even in the midst of uncertainty and waiting. In short, how to live in hope for what has been promised, but has not yet come to pass. On weeks like this one, it's far too easy to be distracted by the ways in which we can make ourselves believe that we have control over the world. It's not to say that our elections aren't important. Of course, they're incredibly important. But as people of God, our trust is not in rulers or principalities or systems. Our confidence is not in our capacity to win or the resources that we hoard along the way, because ultimately, no matter our planning, these things will most certainly fail us. We can get so caught up in our stuff that we forget that our deepest and most true calling is to hold out our lamps, to be the light of the world, ignited and sustained solely by the un- failing love of Christ. In these difficult days, when things that once seemed secure show themselves to be thin and fragile, it could be that our calling is to simply stay the course, searching for signs of God's faithfulness in unimaginable ways and in unexpected ways. Places. Perhaps our task is to order our lives beyond a veneer of religiosity made up of arbitrary do's and don'ts, instead clinging tightly to the hope of Jesus. To move beyond who we think we ought to be or what we ought to have, and to simply be still. My prayer is that in this season of so much uncertainty and waiting, we would resist the temptation to go out in search of temporary comforts and instead place all our confidence in the one who always arrives exactly on time. Peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For all those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Jay Herbert, our stated clerk, Tom, our bishop, and Lisa, our general presbyter, 
and for all bishops, presbyters, and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray for all whose lives are impacted by the coronavirus and for those who are infected, for those who have lost loved ones, and for all healthcare workers and first responders, for the unemployed and all those in need. We pray for our country in this time of unrest, for all victims of hatred, violence, and degradation, for racial reconciliation, and for peace in our cities. We pray for the community of Indian Hill Church that we may serve God faithfully in these uncertain times. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We exalt you, O God, our King. And we praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, a lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Do not be afraid. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.